Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program will begin in one minute. Good afternoon. Good, afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to the first timers. Welcome back to those who are with us this morning. My name is Jason Parker. I am a history professor at Texas A&M University, and I am a member of the board of directors of the Truman Library Institute. I just brought us here uh, today. Uh, I'm here to introduce our third session. Uh, the session title was behind me. Um, Veteran Voices, Desegregation's Impact on the Individual Experience. In his autobiography, Colin Powell, the first black chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the first black secretary of state, said that with Executive Order 9981, the military began, quote, living the democratic ideal ahead of the rest of the country with less discrimination, a truer merit system, and a leveler playing field, close quote. The opportunity created by Truman's action allowed Powell, once again, to love my country with all its flaws and to serve her with all my heart. This afternoon, we have the honor of hearing from four veterans about how Executive Order 9981 impacted their lives and careers. Our moderator will be Ron James Jr. Ron is the author of The Double V, How Wars, Protests, and Harry Truman Desegregated America's Military. The book examines the remarkable history of how the struggle for equality in the military helped to drive the fight for equality in civilian society. His previous books include Root and Branch, Charles Hamilton Houston, Thurgood Marshall, and The Struggle to End Segregation and my favorite of his, The Truman Court's Law and the Limits of Loyalty. A graduate of Yale, Yale University and Duke University School of Law, James has practiced law for two decades here in Washington, DC. Uh, I'm going to give little thumbnail intros of the rest of our panelists so that we can get going and make up some of the time we uh, lost by starting late. Uh, Ambassador John Estrada was uh, served in the Marine Corps for 34 years, is now for a former ambassador to Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, Admiral Michelle Howard retired from the US Navy as our, was one of our panelists. Brigadier General Terrence Adams in the US Air Force is with us today, as is a fellow board member and supporter of the Institute, Brigadier General Donald Scott, retired from the US Army. It is my pleasure to invite this distinguished company to the stage. Join me in welcoming them for the panel. Good afternoon and thank all of you for um, spending some of your time uh, with us to, to discuss um, this very important topic. I am truly honored um, to be sitting on the stage with such a distinguished panel. Um, the, the knowledge that they have, the experience that they have, um, and what they have done to get that experience um, truly leaves me you know, um, humbled to be sitting here um, with them this afternoon. <clears throat> and also, I, I want to thank the, the Truman Institute. I, I, I had um, the pleasure of, of uh, speaking at, at the Truman Presidential Library um, a few years ago and um, really enjoyed the experience. It's a wonderful place to visit if you get the chance. Um, I encourage you to, uh, uh, to visit. Another place I would encourage you to visit is not far from here, and that's the Pentagon. It is not only <clears throat> the largest office building in the world, for better or for worse, but <laughs> it is an actual museum. 
of artifacts, things that you can see just walking down the hall and you see people doing their jobs, you see people of all races, the, the entire panoply that makes up our country. And you see them within your first five minutes of walking in the Pentagon. What you also see along the walls, or the corridors as we call them, um, are um, artifacts from you know, some of our, our you know, uh, most renowned generals. You, know, you, I mean, you can see General MacArthur's pipe there. <laughs> um, but also just from regular um, servicemen and women um, who have served our country through, um, through the ages. Um, and it is really, really something to see. Um, I, I, I enjoy going there. I enjoy when I, when I take, you know, um, when I have some time and, 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 and take a lunch break and being able to walk and see what's on the walls. There are different corridors. There's one corridor devoted entirely to the history of African Americans serving in our military. And that would not have happened at its full purpose without Harry S. Truman who came to his civil rights awakening somewhat slowly and then abruptly. Um, there was, um, I, 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 I was very happy to, to take part in a, a PBS documentary, um, I'm sure you can find, um, discussing the blinding of Isaac Woodard. And this was um, an African-American serviceman returning from uh, overseas duty, and he was, after being confronted by the bus driver in South Carolina, on the bus he was driving, was pulled off the bus and beaten by two police officers, and he woke up the next morning in jail, blind. Harry Truman heard this story in the White House, in the Oval Office, and I, I have said for years, I, I truly believe, if there was a moment when Harry Truman really decided that he needed to desegregate America's armed forces, it was when he learned of the blinding of Isaac Woodard. Because he said to Walter White, the executive director of the NAACP, I had no idea it was as bad as that. With that, I'll turn it over to our distinguished panelists. Thank you. <clears throat> <clears throat> Master Chief, are you in the audience? Master Chief Williams, please come down here. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about you while you come down, because I know, and take your time, because you're of another generation, although I'm kind of on the same kind side of the calendar as you are. <clears throat> when Truman commissioned the Committee for Civil Rights, one of the things they did was look at the state of the armed forces. <laughs> the number of enlisted officers who were African American was minuscule. By the time the commission wrote that report a couple of years after World War II, the Marine Corps had zero African American officers. <laughs> the Navy had two. The emerging Air Force had a couple and the Army had a couple. So the bulk of our presence in the armed forces was the enlisted force. <laughs> Master Chief Williams came into the Navy in 1951. Hmm. He could not serve as an officer. He served as a cook. But he was a leader. And by the time the 70s roll around and the Navy has truly not integrated, Admiral Zumwalt comes in and he selects Master Chief Williams as his advisor because he is a leader and he's one of the few people of seniority as an enlisted person who knows how the Navy works and can talk truth to what's going on. If you wanna see the legacy of Truman's executive order, it's Master Chief Williams' son, Vice Admiral Mel Williams, who was a submarine officer, hmm. who was my boss as a three-star when I was a one-star. It 
If you want to see the continuing legacy of African Americans, it's Master Chief Williams' grandson, a one star in the Marine Corps. Ooh. Mel Williams, his grandson, and I would not be here if, if not for his groundbreaking commitment to the Navy. And if you want to know more, he and his son published a book on leadership, Navigating the Seven Seas. <laughs> Master Chief, I've never had a chance to publicly thank you for what you've done. People say I paved the way, but you paved the way. I retired as a four-star admiral. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <Yeah. laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, I am uh, Donald Scott, and I am just honored to be here. But more importantly, I'm blessed to remember not only the signing date, but where I was uh, and the pathway that it led me to, to this moment. And so when your grandfather uh, signed the order, I was 10 years old. And I was attending a racially segregated school in Northeast Missouri that consisted of three rooms, three teachers for 12 grades. The uh, outlook for my life's journey at that time was I could either be a railroad worker like my dad or I could go to Chicago and get a job in one of the factories like my sisters or I could join one of the military services uh, that was commanded by white officers and maybe be a sergeant or a lieutenant. But things happen because of the signing of 9981, the uh, Supreme Court integrated schools in Missouri and the South. And as a senior, you know, I was integrated into the nearest white high school. Graduated uh, and was taken to, to college by my brother-in-law and I went to Lincoln University, Missouri which, by the way, there's one other Lincoln graduate in here, my dear friend Dorothy Gilliam. Uh, Lincoln is the only historic black college that was founded by former slaves who were Civil War veterans. And so I go to Lincoln, uh, and you had to take ROTC. Hmm. And so I get in ROTC, and it's a match, and I really love it. I enjoy it. I graduate with a bachelor's degree as a distinguished military graduate, and this was in 1960. So shortly after I entered the military, you know, I married my late wife of 57 years. And when we entered, we went through 30 years, eight months, and 17 days. <laughs> and when we entered in 1960, there were no black generals or admirals in any of the services. The Army was still using a racially coded personnel system called the Daily Morning Report that was coded to identify white and black soldiers. So if your name had a one after it, you were white. If it had a two, you were black. The jobs that uh, were most available to blacks then was staff jobs, usually either logistics or transportation. And if you ever saw an, uh, a black flying a helicopter, you knew he could walk on water because it was virtually impossible to get through. 
uh, and pass flight school. And rare did you find a black officer who had graduated from Command General Staff College, which is a mid-level upward mobility school. So that was in 1960. So by the time that I had graduated, uh, by the time that I had retired in 1991, there was a total of 120 black officers in all the services who, who had made general officer or flag officer, and I was one of them. There were also uh, search firms that had been interested in trying to recruit retired generals for certain executive level jobs, and I made that list as well. Now, quickly, let me tell you when I first realized the impact your grandfather's order had on my life. And this was in uh, 2019. I'm at the Truman Library Institute uh, Auditorium. I'm listening to Judge Gurgel talking about his book about the blinding of Isaac Woodard. And when, when Judge Gurgel started talking about uh, the political climate of 1948, it was like an angel hit me on the head with a with a rubber mallet and said, man, you was 10 years old in a racially segregated school. And if he hadn't signed that order, you would not have been a general. And had you not been a general, you would not have been, a, been hired by Manor Jackson to be his chief operating officer for the city of Atlanta. Had that not happened, you would not have been hired by Bill Clinton to be the founding director of AmeriCorps National Civilian Community Corps. And had that not happened, you would not have been selected to be the chief operating officer for the Library of Congress. And I say to you, in 20 minutes, 20 seconds I got left, <laughs> if he had not signed that order, I would not be on this stage speaking to you about that great moment. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies, gentlemen, guests, uh, supporters of the Truman uh, Library Institute. It's a great honor to be here this evening to share my story. So, how did 9981 impact me when I wasn't around 75 years ago? <laughs> how did it impact my career? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, my story is, as a 14-year-old immigrant, 14 years of age, I immigrated to this wonderful city of Washington, D.C. I came to Washington, D.C. I used to look at war movies in Trinidad and Tobago. Never really saw no black action figures or whatever. So, how did it impact me? It impacted me via people such as this. And I'm going to tell a story here of, uh, of uh, a general that I met. But uh, prior to me immigrating, I knew nothing, nothing of racial discrimination, racism. I, the country I came from, we did not have it. I was not called the N-word until after I joined my beloved Marine Corps and I was deployed in Okinawa by a fellow Marine. I was, I was oblivious to that sort of things. So, like I said, even though I was not born uh, 75 years ago, it impacted my career, and I will talk about a story. Uh, it will reflect my encounter with a legendary Marine. At that time, I did not know who this legendary Marine. So I'm a young Marine, aviation mechanic. Uh, I'm going to date myself here. I'm working on F-4 Phantom airplanes, F-4 Phantom fighters early 1974. I'm a Lance Corporal E3 in the Marine Corps. I'm on the flight line at Marine Corps Air Station, Beaufort, South Carolina. Here comes this F-4 Phantom from a Marine Corps Air Station in North Carolina called Cherry Point. The Phantom lands, taxis up to, to my squadron area, and I'm standing outside looking. I'm fairly new in the Marine Corps then, not even a year. And the canopy opened, 
And the person that steps out, I look, tall, black, Marine, had the rank of colonel. I had never, ever seen uh, a, a black pilot, much less a Marine uh, fighter pilot. I was in disbelief, but I was also excited at the same time. I was about 18 years old. So I immediately ran back into the hangar, and uh, there was a few African-American Marines there. It was only a few of us. We knew each other really well. I said, guys, you got to come outside and see this. you got to see this because you're not going to believe me. They came outside, and we were all standing there with our jaws dropping down, and we looked at this guy. I didn't know who this guy was from Adam, and I sure wasn't going to go up and ask him who he was. <laughs> Fast forward. Many years later, I'm going through my Marine Corps career. I hear the Marine Corps has finally promoted its first black general. Again, did my research. I said, wow, that's the guy that I saw back in 1974 on the flight line. Uh, it was then Colonel Peterson. Now he's Brigadier General Peterson. And, but I never had any interaction with uh, General Peterson at all throughout my 34-year career and his long career. Uh, General Peterson went on uh, to uh, attain the rank of Lieutenant General in the Marine Corps. Well, here's a story how he affected me. Lieutenant General Peterson, again, the first African-American <clears throat> aviator, just happened to be a fighter pilot, flew numerous combat missions in Korea, numerous combat missions. And I think one time he got shot, and he said he was not going to crash in Korea. He got out of Korea, <laughs> OK? Numerous. Then he went on to also command a Marine fighter attack squadron in Vietnam. He's a commanding officer of a squadron, 314, called the Black Knights. And I had the honor of serving in that squadron many years later. And I can see on the history board, he commanded that squadron. So again, Never had any professional interaction with him. I got out of the Marine Corps, um, got a little political after I got out. I felt I earned that right to be a, po a politician. <laughs> and I, I met the general in Denver, Colorado. Backstage, as President Obama was getting ready to get nominated as the Democratic nominee. That's why I finally met the general. I said, General, you don't know me from Adam but I must share this story and how you impacted my career decades earlier, three decades earlier. And I will end by saying I had the honor and privilege of attending the ship christening, mm. yes. a name for Lieutenant General Frank E. Peterson, Jr. in Charleston, South Carolina in 2022. Wow. So that is, that is my story. Thank you. wonderful story about how representation matters. Um, so my, my name is Terrence Adams. Um, I started to come and not talk about myself today because I don't necessarily like doing it. And, and I will do some of that in the way of passing some time because I got five <laughs> minutes left. Uh, first, uh, Colonel Aries Mister, you want to raise your hand. So right here in this back corner, Aries Mister, she was just a commander, the base commander at Maxwell Air Force Base. She's the first person who really uh, got me started on this kind of 75th journey about knowing what was going on and about 75 years was coming up. So I just wanted to recognize her because she's done a lot. Uh, I learned from her. She's one of my mentors. Uh, she is a living example of what leadership is all about. So a round of applause for Aries Mister. She's just returning from Montgomery, Alabama, where they had a similar kind of ceremony and recognition of the 75th anniversary as well. I like to recognize Belinda Gurko, and she brought a sidekick, and maybe the judge, the sidekick <laughs> over there. Um, I was the Joint Base Commander at Charleston, um, uh, Joint Base there. I had an opportunity to, to partner with the mayor and some other friends and went back to uh, Charleston for a dinner. I'm hyped up on a conversation that Aries and I had about the 75th, not knowing he wrote the book. about why I, So I'm telling him about all these things I'm going to do, right? And so that funny story led to Dr. Will Rowe, who is now here. So Will was here earlier. I pray for Will and his family. He's uh, at home now uh, taking care of his family. Uh, but Will was a person that I've partnered with 
Um, and he began to help me start this kind of ad hoc committee about the 75th. And that's where I met Alex. So I'm here because of a number of different things. I just wanted to share you how important connection um, are. And so through that journey, we've had an event at the Pentagon. That was just yesterday. Blue Star's family just had an event. And all those individuals participated in this kind of ad hoc group that we kind of started with no leadership. So for all those people, I just wanted to say a quick thanks. So I took two minutes not talking about myself. All right. So, Ter so, and I, I listened to the conversation earlier today, and the judge, when I sat down and talked to him, he was like, your whole career is about this, you know, executive order. So, born in Tuskegee, Alabama, and many of you all may know um, uh, the history of the Tuskegee Airmen, but uh, I'm some, sure some of you all remember Brick House. So, the Commodores are from Tuskegee, Alabama, um, <laughs> along with Rosa Parks being born there, Booker T. Washington, George Washington Carver, the list continues. So, I grew up in this kind of foundation and did not know until last year that I, I knew I grew up on Brickyard Hill, but never knew the red clay dirt was where I was born, uh, formed the bricks that built Tuskegee Institute and Tuskegee University, and just found it out from a historian kind of thing. And so that led me to enlist in the Army um, as a cook. So I did that. So Master Chief, I understand that, that journey of being a food service kind of person. Um, I uh, did two years on active duty at the, what's now Fort Liberty. Um, I was at the previous base at Fort Lee, too. So you know these names and connections. I was at both of those bases when I was on active duty in the Army. Uh, did two years, got out and got into an Army Reserve MASH unit from the previous conversation. Big VA hospital right there in Tuskegee next to John Andrews Hospital, if you know the connection there. And my unit sat in between Tuskegee University and John Andrews Hospital, which is the VA, and a lot of black veterans were there. And again, these are all connections that I don't, didn't understand until my adult life and as far as now becoming a general officer. And so I had an opportunity to get activated for Desert Storm from that unit. I went to Fort Benning, Georgia, now Fort Lee. So these three bases that I was associated with the Army have all been renamed. Um, and so I served there, returned from being activated from the reserves. I was already in college at Auburn University of Montgomery. Uh, and then I went to Alabama State. And you heard um, Dr. Jefferson earlier talk about Alabama State uh, and its connection. Uh, so I'm, and I'm the, the first general officer to be promoted from that ROTC detachment there in Alabama State. Uh, and just wanted to share a few things. I want to end with some thank yous. Um, and I will do that probably in some in question and answers, but you know, it, it's only recently in my life that I'm understanding the connections of my journey. I, I'm now a um, cyber officer in the United States Air Force. I just left the job being a director of cyber operations and warfighter communications at the Pentagon for the Air Force, uh, and then moving over to be the principal cyber advisor to the Secretary of Defense. And so these opportunities that have happened because of the executive order, uh, I wanted to just give you a glimpse of my life. Um, I used the GI Bill to go to college uh, because I didn't want my mom to, uh, to work two and three jobs. And so that, those two years helped to fund the college, you know, college for me. Uh, and it was all because of things that took place that as a young, you know, really nose kind of kid did not know, uh, did not appreciate. Uh, and so the thanks that I would get into is for all those people who paid that price for me all those individuals who paid the debt so that I could have this freedom to serve. And that price was paid heavily by members. If you know the Buffalo Soldiers, um, if you've heard of the Harlem Hellfighters, um, if you heard of the Tuskegee Airmen, which is from my hometown, uh, and then also the 6 you know, Postal Battalion. Uh, these men and women uh, who raised their hand to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, to bear true faith and allegiance to the same that took an obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and well and faithfully discharged the duties of the office that they entered. I want to say thank you to them, thank you for the Truman Institute, sir, and thank you for your grandfather. Well, thank you all. That was, <clears throat> that was very moving. My, my grandfather served in the uh, segregated army during World War II. Um, my father, who here, is here now, is a retired commander, United States Navy, and two of my uncles are, um, one is a retired major, um, Army Ranger, and the other is a, a retired colonel and a um, surgeon for the Army. And so- What is with the Army? <laughs> <laughs> no love, no love. <laughs> Where's the love of the Air Force and the Navy? Come on, man. Where's the love? We're just like to be all you can be. <laughs> um, 
And so I, I, I truly appreciate you know, hearing your stories. Um, what, what I'm interested in hearing from each, each of you, and first I'm going to interrupt myself and just give um, kudos to the Truman Institute in that we have it, it, it <laughs> what's with the army, but we have, we, have the, we have the four branches here. And I think that is good planning. It shows intelligence about our armed forces. And I just want to give a hat tip um, to that. And I'll represent I the Space the Force, too. <laughs> okay, okay. And that, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I love it. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, but I'm interested in hearing it. Um, we, we've heard um, um, each of you talk a bit about your decision to join um, the armed forces, join uh, uh, you know, government service. But can you talk about when, um, when and what influenced your decision to make a career of it? Because you all are distinguished leaders in um, the armed forces, and it's a different thing from you know, entering, then one has to excel, and then one has to make the decision. Um, to make a, um, a career out of it. So I, I, I'm interested in hearing about that. Ma'am? So I think sometimes it's uh, hard to think about society around the armed forces. And I mean, people will talk about the challenges in the armed forces, but uh, that makes us forget there were challenges for women and, and, and people of color in our society when you're talking from World War II to the modern day. When I started in the Navy, women were probably making 48 cents on the dollar compared to men. So I had served on my first and second ship, and um, I completed my obligation, and I was thinking about leaving. And I thought this needs to be an intelligent decision. So I used my circle of friends and, and I'm not from Florida, but I was stationed in Florida at the time, Pensacola, said, I would like to talk to, find and talk to uh, African Americans who are in professional jobs, engineering, et cetera. And so I did. I found three people and I took them to lunch when the, when the ship was in port. The first was an architect in uh, Pensacola. And he said, he, we talked about our lives, what was going on, he said, stay in you have more opportunity than I do at this firm. The second um, was a researcher, technical graduate from uh, Georgia University, um, hired by Kodak. Um, she was hired to be a researcher, African-American woman and a professional engineer, and had never been allowed in any of the engineering aspects of Kodak. She was an administrator. She says, Michelle, I get paid well. So this is uh, 1985, and she was making probably 70000 a year back then. She goes, but I'm window dressing. Uh, the third person uh, was an administrator, administrator in a local school. And then um, he was astonished to find out I got paid the same as my male counterparts because the military requires that, government requires that. But for most of us, in those time frames, if you were a woman or, or a person of color, you should expect, sadly, that you weren't gonna get paid upon hiring, or even after years of excellent work, the same as someone who walked through the door who happened to be a white male. What really surprised me is they, all three of them across these different communities, thought I had more opportunity to advance in the military than they did in any of their lives as, professional, as professionals. And I thought, maybe I need to think about why I want to stay in. And then I realized I not only, I liked being at sea, I liked the work, but it was the sailors. The leadership opportunity, but it's what the sailors can do. I've often said it's, there's nothing like a tough mission and watching the sailors and Marines come up with a miracle plan and then make it happen. And who would want to give that up to be a librarian? <laughs> and so I stayed in. Uh, and then after that, I wanted to command. And I eventually got to command. But really, it was surprising. It was the lack of opportunity in our civilian society mm -hmm. that was a big factor in me deciding to stay Navy. 
Thank you. Well, for me, it was, uh, it was all about choices. Uh, back in 1960, the choices for an African-American graduating from college were very limited. Um, so I didn't want to be a, a teacher in a black school. And the Army offered an avenue of adventure with some rank and prestige. But the real reason, when I got married and had a son, then I had to figure out where can I go to get better support and service than what I already have. And so 10 years turned to 15, 15 to 20, 20 to 25, 30 years, eight months, 17 later, I am <laughs> happy, man. I'm good to go. Yeah. So what, what influenced me to make it a career? Uh, f the first thing I mentioned earlier was, as a young kid, I'm watching American war movies in Trinidad and Tobago. The movie that stood out, Sands of Iwo Jima, John Wayne. Yeah. So I knew back then that I wanted to be a Marine. I get to Washington, D.C., it took me a little while to build the courage up to join the Marine Corps, join the Marine Corps. There was two uh, impacting um, events, I would say. Uh, my first assignment when I saw the general, General Peterson, didn't know who he was at that time. But I had a boss back then. He came from the era of 9981, a Caucasian Marine. He was my NCIC, non-commissioned officer in charge. And uh, for some reason, I mean, he had seen it all, the good, the bad, and the ugly. He had almost 20 years in the Marine Corps at that time. This was back in 74. And he said to me, um, you know, uh, Estrada, you look like you're going to make a pretty good, good, good Marine. He said, uh, and they were having problems uh, uh, with drugs and stuff back then. He said, I'm going to recommend that we assign you overseas to Japan so you could get away from this stuff that's going on back here right mm -hmm. now. Gunnery Sergeant Adams, I remember him today. Uh, guy had like eight daughters. He was still trying to have a son. <laughs> I would always remember him. God, that's <laughs> <laughs> so. You could see his glasses. Mm -hmm. Sent me overseas for 13 months. So that was the first uh, uh, impact. The one that really did it, around 10 years in the Marine Corps, I am thinking, all right, I did my time. It's time that I get out. There was not really too much happening. Uh, the Marine Corps seemed like it was just kind of floundering around. And we got this new commandant, new commandant of the Marine Corps, uh, the 29th uh, General Alfred Gray, who used to be a former enlisted. He was a uh, sergeant. Got out, used his GI Bill or whatever. Many years later, he is now the commandant of the Marine Corps. Rough, tough, tobacco chewing, spitting. Uh, just did not do the norm. He wore his camouflage uh, uh, uniform to events when the other ch uh, chiefs of the services wore the dress uniform. And this guy was taking us back to the Marine Corps, back to basic warrior training. And like I said, I was on the cusp of getting out. So I said, you know what? I'm going to stick around and see where this guy is going to take the Marine Corps. And that was the decision, the most important decision right there. This one commandant didn't know me from Adam, influenced me to stick around. And that is why I stayed in. Fast forward, I'm becoming the, I am now becoming Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, the 15th Sergeant Major in the history of the Marine Corps. Well, every former commandants and sergeants majors of the Marine Corps attends this ceremony. Here's General Gray. He's retired now. Again, I, I just knew him as commandant. I was way down here. He was way up here. <laughs> and I, uh, just before I uh, officially took over, I went over to General Gray. I said, uh, commandant, I said, uh, you only know me because of the ceremony that's getting ready to happen here. I'm getting ready to be a course 15 sergeant major. I say, I want to thank you. I am standing here this evening getting ready to take the post as a 15th Star Major Marine Corps because of your leadership back then. That is what influenced me to stand. Uh, about me, so um, I'm at 36 years of service now, um, and I continue to serve because of representation, which you talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, I find myself now um, at this stage of the career um, is being uh, really thinking deeply about the journey 
Um, I'm the, the first, you know, general officer from Tuskegee, Alabama on active duty. Uh, Russell Gray was in the, uh, Russell Davis uh, was a three star in charge of the National Guard Bureau and the reserves in the Guard. Uh, I'm, again, I mentioned also, also the first general officer promoted from my ROC detach, detachment. Uh, there are probably more people who want, you know, more for me than I want for myself, you know, at this point, and they are urging me and want me to continue to serve. So I do continue to serve for the representation. I know it's important. I know in some cases people can't be what they can't see. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I want to be visible and to do that. I also continue to serve uh, for opportunity. Uh, not opportunity now for myself, but the opportunity I can provide others. Uh, I get to sit in a lot of meetings and be in a lot of uh, positions where um, I can now, you know, make decisions to help others. Uh, and so and I also say not everybody is kind of built for the work that we need to do in the future. Uh, and I think from my background growing up in Tuskegee, um, I was probably born with some DNA structures that uh, many of not just because of where I'm from and, and probably how I grew up, what I saw. Um, and, uh, and so my, my leadership tenets now are listen, lift, and love. Uh, and so I get to come to conferences like this and listen to the two panels earlier today. I get to lift people up by pouring into them um, because uh, people have poured into me. Uh, and I think what we need as we move forward in our nation is a more conversation uh, about love and how it would factor into what we need to do to move forward. And so the final thing I continue to serve um, because, of, um, because of that lift part of listen, lift, love is that somebody lifted me up. General Ronnie Hawkins, or General Adam Zender, uh, who kind of poured into me, um, showed me things, taught me things that I were, was not aware of, uh, and I continue to want to do that uh, for other people. Uh, I, and I mentioned some of those folks, uh, like Will Rowe, who kind of poured in, uh, and just meeting somebody. Uh, so after George Floyd, I started this uh, group with some people called Crucial Convo. Uh, I met Will through those endeavors from a, a lady named Sandy out in California. Uh, and just seeing Will and what Will was doing, I was inspired to do more, all right? It's almost like when you're running a race and see some competition, right? You see others uh, out there representing and doing things, and then so that inspiration has come from other people uh, who are connected to me, uh, and those individuals uh, really inspire me uh, and inspire me to continue to serve. Uh, we talked, talked to Dr. Rowe, we talked about opportunities, we talked about, um, in some cases, um, how optimistic are you? And, and this is what I get that question often. And, and so I get the, do you think this, this glass is half full, the glass is half empty, <laughs> right? Uh, and I say, I'm just happy to have a glass, <laughs> right? Um, because there are, there are ways to look at life um, that you don't have to accept the two choices that people give you, all right? You can create your own choices. You can create your own path. Uh, so as we look at the path moving forward, I would say that path, the that has a, a wider windshield of opportunity, I would say, uh, as I'm listening to the forums and the historians today, I would say that opportunity where history will f serve always, you know, as a glimpse of the things that we don't want to do and some of the things that we can do, uh, that is in our review mirror. That is in our rear mirror. The windshield of opportunity is wide, it's bright, uh, and I want to be the person to kind of represent that for the nation and represent that for those who want to follow behind me. So those are the reasons why I continue to serve. Thank you, sir. And I want to um, build on um, something that, that, that uh, you, you mentioned, um, General Adams, is, is um, feeling that need to be present, because I know that I have felt that um, in my professional life, in my academic life. Um, and it sometimes can feel like a bit of a burden um, and I'm interested to know, particularly given how, how high each of you rose, have risen through the ranks, um, how, you, how you dealt with that, you know, now, particularly now that the military at long last is focusing a bit more on uh, emotional health, mental health and things like that. But at the time, at the times when you were, you know, coming up in the ranks, that was not um, as much of a focus, um, at least not publicly so. Um, and so I'm just interested to hear, it's a bit of a personal question kind of, but I'm interested to hear how you um, dealt with that and, and worked through it and, and, and got to you know, where, where you ended up. Um, so after Desert Storm, I was one of the few women who actually served in Desert Storm and uh, I was chief engineer on an ammunition ship. 
and the logistic ships had just opened up to women. So by Navy calculations, out of the probably hundreds of thousands of sailors and the six carriers we had over there, maybe 2,000 women, officer and enlisted, had ex wartime experience at sea because of Desert Storm, and I was one of them. So Congress decides to look at, um, okay, maybe it's time to repeal the combat exclusion law because we had women prisoners of war and uh, women dying in Desert Storm. Sadly, I'm not sure how they missed that we had women prisoners of war and women die in World War II, but okay. Um, they create a commission. They're going to debate this. Uh, because I was one of the few women with sea experience and an officer and on a short tour, I was made the spokesperson for the Navy for this issue. And I was on top of my regular job, and it was quite a burden. And I would complain all the time. And, finally talked to my mother one day on the phone about having twice as much work as any of my colleagues, and she said, well, that's just kind of where you are. And uh, if you don't accept it, you should quit. Hmm. She said, if you stay with the Navy, no one's going to keep up with you because you're so far ahead. So this is going to be your life. And she was right. The additional burden of duties, representational duties, um, uh, and I, I was mad as a junior officer. You know, they'd say, okay, we, you know, we're having an official visit from the Russians. We want to have some women officers out there. And I go, this is coming down to broad duty. That's the only reason I'm being selected. Really? <laughs> Sir? <laughs> <laughs> and I was getting the, you know, so by the time I'm uh, selected as a one star, I am kind of at my fill. When you make one star, the Navy has this wonderful program. You do your Leadership 360, you go, and then at the end of a week of <clears throat> leadership, reinforcement of fundamentals, you get a coach, a civilian coach hired by the Navy to go over your scores and have a conversation with you. My coach that the Navy selected was an African-American women psychologist. I thought, oh my gosh, she's going to be able to give me insights. How do you manage all this? How do you live with this burden? And so we get together that Saturday, we go over my scores, and I am like, it is so much. It's hard to be motivated. How do I do it? What do I do? And by the way, I'm so glad you're my coach for this. And she goes, oh, oh, Admiral, oh, Admiral, that is so easy. Come in, lean in, lean in. And I'm like, okay, the secret, I'm getting ready to write it down. <laughs> and she goes, fake it till you make it. <laughs> <laughs> How much is the Navy paying you? <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized she has perfect understanding of the human condition. Her message delivery may have been rough because I was a sailor. But if you think about Maya Angelou, she said, if you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude. I needed to change my attitude. No one is going to motivate me. I have to motivate myself. If the question was uh, being sympathetic to uh, the human condition because of trauma, uh, I would have to I would have to reflect back on being an infantry officer and the two tours that I had in Vietnam. Uh, and I was with an infantry battalion, uh, the first tour, and saw enough combat action to lose some people. And so when I got back to the, you know, to the States, I was having trouble sleeping at night, um, didn't want to watch TV because I, I didn't want to be reminded of the news that they flashed about helicopter gunships being shot at and artillery. And so I just gutted it out and went through it. Well, about 15 years, 10 years after I retired, uh, friend of mine says, you need to go 
get checked out for the syndrome. I said, what syndrome? Well, you know, you was in combat. Maybe you got some issues. So I go and I talk to the lady and she says, why didn't you come in earlier? I said, because I wanted to stay in the military. If I had come in as a major, then a stigma would have been attached. And I would not have been able to continue. Now, fast forward, you know, in this day and time, I am very sensitive to individuals who uh, are harmed in that way and in other physical ways. And the conundrum is, the reality is, war is that kind of thing. And in order to get through it, you know, you have to have tough-minded people who will push through, not think about what is, could happen. Um, and I'm just thankful that the VA and, and, and other medical practitioners now are more able and capable of taking care of the wounded, uh, both psychologically and physically. But it's a tough, it's a tough business. Uh, you gotta have tough people and you have to have people who know how to care for folks that we're talking about. Yes, sir. So you, you bring up a topic that uh, gets me a little emotional when I, when I talk about it. So as uh, General just said, it's a, it's a tough business. Um, and I don't want to call it a burden. So when I became uh, the 15th Sergeant Major of the United States Marine Corps, I was actually selected from that position while deployed to war. I was a Sergeant Major for the 3rd Marine Aircraft Wing. So one day, I went from having to care about 17,500 Marines to 250,000 plus Marines. And being that I was selected from the combat zone, I knew what the Marines wanted and I made it my, my, my job. I think my first year in an assignment here at the Pentagon, I was gone 257 days or so out of the year getting in front of my Marines across the country and overseas. I wanted to do that because I had an affinity with them. I was on the battlefield. And I, I, I will call it a load. I don't want to call it a burden because I'm standing there and I'm speaking to them. I'm looking at them with their bright eyes and everything, all, you know, male, females. They're getting ready to go off to war. And I'm here motivating them. You need to go do this. You don't let the Marines down there win before you. That's, that's the Marine thing to do. And at the same time, I am struggling inside because I knew from the position I served in in the Marine Corps, we really did not need to go to war. That is the one reason why I, uh, I, I, I got political after I left the Marine Corps. I went and supported a president who said he was going to end the war. Well, that didn't happen, but that was a motivating force for me to go support him because I had seen so many of my Marines damaged on the battlefield, coming back home in body bags, but yet I had to keep that pace up and get back in front of them wherever they may be as they're getting ready to deploy. And one of the things I wanted to do as a leadership, I wanted to get in front of them and look them in the eye, knowing very well that some of them were not coming back home or they wouldn't come back home broken. I carried that around. No one would ever knew that I felt badly about the war, but I had to do this uh, so, they, so they looked at me with strength, you know, and I'm doing everything else behind the scene hoping the war would end, but that was my business. So, I don't want to call it a burden, but I will tell you that, that uh, I agonized about that every time I had to stand in front of those Marines. And finally, after many years after leaving the Marine Corps, I finally went and sat down and spoke to someone about how I felt at that time. I couldn't do it before. It took a lot of time. So I say I get a little emotional talking about that one. I am right now. I had to hold that in. And tell my Marines, it's okay, you're doing the right thing, when I know we should not have been doing it in the first place. That's my piece. Mm -hmm.
so, so for me, not burden, mm -hmm. um, opportunity, it's the same thing with that glass that's sitting over there, right? Half full, half empty. It's about an opportunity. One, an opportunity because if you have been, there's not been a person in that position before you, now you can begin to uh, bring some new thinking to positions because of your background. Uh, so those things present opportunities. All uh, right, to share who we are and the reason why I am who I am. Mm -hmm. uh, without that, and, and then now your airmen or your soldiers, your sailors, they get to benefit from your background because they may not have had a leader in there before. You know, after George Floyd and we were, I had to do some internal thought process. I was getting a lot of phone calls and this was the reason why Crucial Combo started. People asking me, how do they respond? I was just coming out of being a joint base commander, all my other wing commander friends did not, they were not prepared to answer that question about what to do, about what they saw. Uh, and so I said to myself, maybe if I had talked more about my journey, you know, they would have known more, or shared more, been able to respond. Uh, so those things aren't necessarily burdens, but there is a risk, right? You know, I've never wanted to talk about, you know, in some ways how I grew up. Uh, you may get ostracized in some ways when you do that. Uh, you don't know, Im imposter syndrome could be kicking in. You just don't know. And so now I'm encouraging leaders to just lead boldly. Like, and that's what Iris Minster did. I mean, she led boldly um, when she was at Maxwell Air Force Base. And there will always be people who are gonna take pot shots at you for doing it. But you have to be confident internally to know what you wanna do. Uh, you have to know that you're trying to make a difference and do it for good. And then for those folks, that's why in some ways I exist, is to encourage them to ensure that they know that there's a community that will surround them, that community will, will show them love, that community will listen to them, lift them up and show them love. Uh, and so when there's opportunity that presents, I think it's time for us to kick down the door. There will be other incidents in our great nation that we're gonna have to respond to. Uh, and we all need to be ready. And so, so I have this flag here. So again, there are like a bunch of things that came out, different cities started doing events. So if, if Alex is here, Right, he came in on our phone calls. And so this comes from, I think, one in Florida. So different organizations around, we had maybe about 100 different organizations represented uh, in this kind of ad hoc committee. Uh, and this was some extras left, so I have some down here. Now, I, I had another one that had something about the executive order, but when I just looked at this, this is not the same one I gave to Dr. Thomas if she's around. Uh, this is one that says what the three things were that I worked with Real Road to celebrate this, you know, 9981, uh, to educate, because education, I believe, is that one of the keys to success. While people don't know what they don't know, we have to educate them and unite. Uh, I think the unification and uniting around this topic in America, in America is an opportunity. And that's what I was trying to use this 75th anniversary to do, uh, is to celebrate it so people will kind of know what took place 75 years ago. Uh, I think the nation needs to know this and to be educated about this history. You can kind of hear from the panels before and then last night why we all should be educated, like what this one decision did, how there's connecting the dots throughout our democracy, uh, and then to, to unite the nation around that. There are so many, um, I would say, opportunities for negativity for us to talk about. I think the men and women who see through this compassion lens calls love, uh, we should not whisper love. We should begin to shout love. We should begin to, you know, all the negativity, you know, throw in love into the conversations around your office uh, about negativity. Uh, we need to do better in, in our nation. And I think it starts with men and women like you uh, having a kind of conversation that we're having today. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. I think we need uh, to um, go ahead and, and do, we, in the interest of time, and we promised everyone we'd be done by 3.15. So I um, wanted to ask, somebody want to ask a question about, um, do you think it made a difference that Truman himself had um, military experience? Um, that that uh, made the difference, as opposed to, say, someone like Roosevelt, who certainly felt pressure um, during the war to, to move forward on uh, eliminating discrimination. Do you think Truman's own background as um, a soldier sort of tipped the scales? Uh, I'll take, I, I um, wrote in, in one of my books that I absolutely believe that that made a difference, that he actually had served um, in war and served in infantry and so uh, when, he did, which then gets back to uh, World War II, um, he had um, um, 
as generous in, 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 in affinity and an affection for what for for the soldiers in combat. And I think it absolutely made a difference. Um, president Roosevelt was, was you know, one, of our, one of our greatest presidents and you know, uh, um, assistant secretary of, of, of the Navy, but he did have a very different lived experience by the same, um, not by the same measure, but differently, um, Doris Kearns Goodwin has written several times about how um, President Roosevelt after he, uh, he was a different person after he had polio and how that changed him. So suddenly he had more affection for people, more understanding. So um, just like we bring all of our experiences to bear in our personal lives and professional lives, that absolutely was the case with President Truman. Anybody else wanna, mm. wanna comment on that? Yes. Uh, yes, I, I think, uh, President Truman was very much driven by the, uh, by, by the leadership required to get men ready for battle. Because uh, in World War I, you know, he really went to extraordinary lengths to uh, qualify to become an officer because he had bad eyesight. But he was able to, to whip his people into shape because he was a disciplinarian. Uh, and I think that served him very well when he gave the order as president that we are going to desegregate. And all of his generals, and many of them, you know, had achieved five star rank, said, ah, he says, yes, and you're going to lead the charge. So I think that kind of uh, that kind of training, background, respect, you know, for another person's energy to, to, to be pulled together for a common good is what President Truman had. And one thing I, I, I want to end with uh, while I'm talking about that is I think the, the greatest lesson that I get from President Truman is how willing are you to use your influence in the position that you enjoy for the good of others. And that has been the one component of leadership that I think made the difference between the desegregation dropping dead and going no place mm. <laughs> is he was willing to put it all on the line because he knew it was right and he was determined that so long as he was president that no matter the race of the generals, the friends who says, don't do this Mr. President, he knew it was right. And so President Truman has changed my life. And he's changed my life from the standpoint that, uh, that we're all in this life and we're all given choices by God our creator. And you can choose who to follow, what to believe, and how to go about it. And if you have the courage of your convictions to do what you think is right, and especially if you have a platform, a position, authority, then you can change the world, as President Truman has done. It's our time, so I think um, on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Truman Library Institute, I'd like to thank our moderator and our distinguished panel um, for sharing their life experiences and their thoughts with us today. Thank you, Admiral. You are awesome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Are we through? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But they want us to. <laughs>